Let's talk about the extremes of economic market structures. And you're gonna to wanna to look at this from a buyer's perspective as well as a seller's perspective. And by the end of this video, you'll better understand where some of your favorite products and services fall within these categories. We're gonna cover four main categories of economic market structures. One, perfect competition. Two, monopolistic competition. Three, oligopoly. Four, monopoly. All right, let's dive into this. Our first category is perfect competition. Perfect competition is more of a theoretical market structure where sellers are competing against each other with the same products and buyers have many options to choose from. Since buyers have a lot of options because we're in a perfectly competitive environment, they are in control of the pricing. The buyers control the market. That means demand is perfectly elastic because if a seller raises their price, the buyer can just go to another competitor and get the product they're looking for at the lower price. Sellers have to compete with many other companies that are selling the same or similar products. There are no big sellers. There's no big companies in a perfectly competitive market. Sellers are price takers, and if they do decide to raise prices, they are going to lose business to another company that is selling the same product at a lower price. Now, in the short term, a lean, well-run company in a perfectly competitive market can earn profits. However, over the long run, profits will diminish over time as the market equilibrium for perfectly competitive companies will result in zero economic profits. You're competing against multiple competitors and it's gonna get very tight on pricing and even tighter on margins and profits. What about innovation in a perfectly competitive environment? Well, there isn't a ton of incentive to innovate because long-term, there isn't any profits really to be made. And there's also not gonna be a lot of cash flow for research and development because there's a lot of companies competing for the same products and services, and none of them are gonna have excess cash to invest in research and development. Are there any barriers to entry when you're trying to enter into a perfectly competitive market. It's gonna have the least amount of barriers to entry, especially compared to the next three categories that we're going to cover. In a perfectly competitive market, there are lots of companies selling similar products, similar services. You can jump in, sell those similar products and services. It's one of the easiest categories, one of the easiest markets to get into. Category number two, monopolistic competition. Monopolistic competition is when you have many businesses in a market that offer differentiated products. Companies are not perfectly competitive and characteristics like brand name, quality, and experience can make a difference. This helps companies stand out in the marketplace. Buyers will still have a lot of options and they will have preferences because there's enough differentiation in monopolistic competition that buyers will have preferences that they'll actually pay more money for. And that's a, that's a key distinction between perfect competition and monopolistic competition. Since sellers offer differentiated products, they can, if they have a good product, sell for marginally higher prices, which can also result in higher profits. Sellers are still price takers in this situation. Buyers still have some control over the market because there are substitutes. They, not, they might not be perfect substitutes like in perfect competition, but they're still substitutes to a product. So a company doesn't have a ton of wiggle room to raise prices, but if they have a good product, they can raise the price. Examples of monopolistic competitive markets will include Hotels, restaurants, clothing, this is where you have a lot of options in the marketplace, but there is differentiation within those markets where people will have preferences over one type of product or another. In the short term, a strong brand name or early product to market can result in better than average sales and profitability. However, over the long term, brand names and differentiation are key to holding on to market share, but marginal revenue will decline over the long term due to competition. 
In a monopolistic competitive market, there is a lot of incentive to innovate. Whether you're first to market with a product, whether you have technology that's better than another competitor, monopolistic competition has a lot of competitors. And with competition, it's going to drive innovation because everyone's going to try to one up the other. And if you can one up the other company, you're more than likely going to be able to drive higher sales and higher profits. Now, I've mentioned brand names several times talking about monopolistic competitive markets. Advertising is one thing that can help develop a company's brand name. It helps companies differentiate themselves in the marketplace. A brand can influence a buyer even before they step in the store. A brand with a reputation, a positive reputation, can sell products and services at a higher price, which ultimately leads to higher profits. Developing a solid brand name is something critical in a monopolistic competitive market. Are there any barriers to entry in a monopolistic competitive market? Now, it's it's going to be a little bit harder than a perfectly competitive market because you're trying to differentiate yourself from the rest of the competitors. That is a little bit more difficult than a perfectly competitive market, but there isn't a ton of barriers to entry if you want to set up a company or a service unlike the next two categories that we're going to talk about. If you've gotten any value out of this video so far, please smash that like button and consider subscribing. All right, we're going to go into oligopoly. An oligopoly is an economic market structure where buyers only have three to five companies that they can buy particular products and services from. There is not many options like perfect competition or monopolistic competition for the products and services that they're looking for. Buyers in this situation are going to be price takers since there's only a select amount of companies offering these products and services in an oligopoly. Buyers do not control the market. For example, if a buyer wants a soft drink, more than likely it's going to be a Coca-Cola or Pepsi product. If you have a cell phone, more than likely, it's going to be a Verizon, AT&T, or T-Mobile service that you're signed up for. That's another example of an oligopoly. From a seller's perspective, there's only a couple competitors that you're competing with. And these companies use the market to establish their price. You're going to look at the three to five companies that you're competing with and look at their price. And that is really going to be where the market is going to be set. There is some interdependence between companies. Now, this interdependence can result in collusion. Since there are only a couple players in the market, there is a lot of temptation to collude, meaning company A reaches out to company B, simultaneously raise prices. There is a fine line between competing and collusion within an oligopoly. Let's talk barriers to entry because this is going to be very different from the other two categories that we've talked about so far. New companies will have a challenging time establishing themselves in a market that is an oligopoly. Legal costs, patents, startup capital, supplies, raw materials. This can be overwhelming hurdles for a company trying to establish themselves when you have three to five competitors in that marketplace. In addition, Companies will strategize against newcomers to the market. They can undercut uh, competition with price wars, or they can just make you an offer you can't refuse through M&A mergers and acquisitions. Another barrier to entry and a strategic advantage an oligopoly, a company within an oligopoly will have, is the, the ability to develop operational efficiencies. These economies of scale can give them such a strategic advantage and make it almost impossible for a new company to establish themselves within that marketplace. If you have economies of scale, you can double production, and that doubling of production doesn't necessarily mean you're doubling your cost of that production. There's plenty incentive to innovate within an oligopoly. You're still competing with one, two, three other major players within your industry. Innovating or innovations can give you a strategic advantage over those other competitors. Now, in addition, a large company within an oligopoly should have the financial backing to invest in research and development, which is another advantage for a large company that has cash flow or excess cash. Our last category, monopoly. 
A monopoly, as indicated by the board game itself, is when one seller controls the market. There is no competition. Buyers have one seller to go to. Buyers in this situation are price takers. They have no alternatives. There is no market forces within a monopoly. Buyers are simply subjected to what the sellers sell their product and services for. Sellers, they completely control the market. The seller has effective barriers to entry, which we will talk about in greater detail. A seller can raise the price as high as the elasticity of demand is for their product and service in a monopoly. As we stated, monopolies have an effective barrier to entry. New companies just cannot get established when a monopoly is present. Now let's go through several examples of barriers to entry. Number one, a monopoly can control access to raw materials or key supplies, which can just completely box out another company trying to compete with it in the marketplace for a particular product or service. Number two, trying to compete with an established monopoly is going to cost a fortune. And even if you raise the capital, the cash that you need to compete with a monopoly, you're still probably going to lose if an established monopoly is already in place. Number three, economies of scale. A monopoly could have production or technology that makes it impossible for other companies to compete. Four is legal brick walls. Patents, licensing, and other types of restrictive legal means can prevent competition legally from competing with a monopoly. And the last one, which isn't comprehensive, is government regulations. Like a regulated utility company, like the water electricity, there might be government regulations in place to establish one company to offer a particular service. Since monopolies prevent a free market from taking place, there are antitrust laws established to assess, prevent, and break up monopolies if a monopoly does take place. The three primary antitrust laws are the Sherman Act of 1890, the Clayton Act of 1914, and the Federal Trade Commission Act of 1914. Two of the largest antitrust breakups in U.S. history were, was Standard and Oil and the Bell Company, which had a monopoly over telecom. Once a company becomes a monopoly and controls the market, there isn't as much motivation to innovate. They are raking in profits without a competitor in sight. A classic example is when the Bell Companies were broken up. Up until that point, there was basically one type of phone that plugged into the wall. Once the Bell Company was broken up, a variety of phone services and ultimately cellular service came to the market, breaking up the monopoly and reintroducing competition within the telecom market led to a renaissance in innovation within the telecom industry. All right, that is the four main economic market structures. And I hope you learned something from this video and I will see you in the next one. Take care and goodbye.